Exodus chapter 12, 12, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 3. I want to welcome everybody here, and I want to welcome everybody out there uh, watching on YouTube today, and glad that you're joining us. But we're going to be talking about completing our course, and God wants us to complete the course of our life with great joy. Hebrews chapter 12, <clears throat> we're going to be in verse 1 through 3, and I'd like to start out today by just saying that God didn't save your soul. He didn't save my soul just to start the race, but he saved your soul to finish the race. Don't miss that part. It's, I'm glad that God saves people, but, and they start on a course, but God's idea is that you finish that course and that you run well. And so I'd like to begin by showing you an inspirational video of something that really happened back in 1968. So I hope you enjoy this. And if you could just let that video roll, uh, enjoy. For some, the reward is a personal one, the knowledge that they finished what they set out to do. A little over an hour after Mama Walde crosses the finish line, John Stephen Aquari of Tanzania approaches the stadium the last man to complete the journey. A voice calls from within to go on, and so he goes on. Afterwards it was written, Today we have seen a young African runner who symbolizes the finest in the human spirit. A performance that gives true dignity to sport. A performance that lifts sport out of the category of grown men playing at games. A performance that gives meaning to the word courage. All honor to John Stephen Akwari of Tanzania. Perhaps the words of John Stephen Aquari epitomize all that is right in the human spirit. When asked why he did not quit, he said simply, My country did not send me 5,000 miles to start the race. They sent me 5,000 miles to finish the race. no matter what sport that they could watch that and they would be inspired to give it all you got and then a little bit more beyond that um, but by the same token I think it's inspirational to us you know we're going to be reading about a cloud of witnesses and a lot of people think that they're you know watching us that there's people looking through floors in heaven and checking us out but what we're going to see here clearly is that these people that are being spoken about are from what we have studied in the hall of faith of Hebrews chapter 11 and they are a witness to us, not a witness of us. So even as John Stephen Aquari is a witness to us, it's inspirational of not giving up. There's nobody in the stands. And if you're wondering about what was tied around his knee, he crashed in the marathon of the 68 Olympics, and he dislocated his knee and he finished. And that happened in the middle of the race. He also injured his shoulder on that fall. And so he kept on going, and it speaks to me that even when things are difficult, that you just keep being faithful to what God called you to do. And in your life, uh, that's also good news for you, that God is in your corner cheering you on. He's cheering you on in your life to victory, to letting go of that which is going to hinder you and putting on that which God has for you. So let's go ahead and, uh, Robert, if you could come on up and share with the people. Let's stand for the reading of the word. 
Hebrews chapter 12, we're in verse 1. 1 through 3. Therefore, since we have so great a clouds of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. For those of you who can, could you please uh, take a knee because your word says that every knee will bow and every tongue confess. Those who can't, just have a seat because God can hear you right where you are in your prayers. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the holy and righteous name of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you for this building that you have allowed us to meet in every single Sunday since this all started. And we, we give you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor, Lord. We thank you for your word and all the promises that are there in it. There's far too many for me to bring up in the time I have to pray today, but I'd like to focus on the two that you brought to my heart. Exodus 14:14 14, 14 says that you will fight for us while we keep silent. And we thank you for that, Lord God, that you're always there fighting for us, even when we don't see it. And your word says in Ephesians 6, 9, and 10, that if we put on the full armor of God, that you will give us the strength and the might to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. And we thank you for that, Lord God. Lord, we ask that you would pour out your spirit and anoint Pastor Huck to speak today, that you would speak through him, that we would clearly hear the words that you have for us, that we would take them and apply them to our lives, and in so doing, to share them with others throughout the week. And we thank you, and we praise you in the most holy and righteous name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right, you may be seated. Yeah, my country did not send me to the Olympics to start the race. My country sent me here to finish, and that's what our God's mind is also, that we would finish a race that God has set, and we don't quit before it's over. And so in the first section of our text here, in the outline notes covered by a cloud of witnesses, we want to define what this is. Um, I remember that there was a long time ago this country western song that talked about somebody who passed away and that they were looking uh, through these holes in the floor of heaven and crying, which is totally opposite of what goes on in heaven, and that the rain was really that person's teardrops falling through the floor and all the holes of the floor of heaven. It's though heaven has a floor that's rotting. Anyway, you know, and they got these people up there, and it's not like all the saints of old from the Old Testament and the Hall of Faith that we studied here for a few weeks, that they're all in a big huddle looking through holes and watching what you're doing. And they say, oh, wow, look look what Clint did. Can you believe he did that? Unbelievable. <laughs> you know, it's just not happening. That's not what that's saying. They are a witness to us. They are not a witness of us. It is their faith that produced endurance that is a testimony to me and to you that when we read chapter 11, we see that they did not receive the promises. They didn't receive the fullness of the promise even of Messiah until the cross and, of course, the resurrection. And we studied that last week. You'll notice in verse 1 of chapter 12, the Bible says, therefore. And whenever you see the word therefore, you have to ask yourself what? What's it there for? And just by way of reminder, what is that there for? And it's there so that we will remember all that they went through, all the great difficulties, not receiving the promises, but dying in faith and enduring to the end, never losing that faith. They're a witness to us, not of us. And there's, therefore, they're speaking to you today. They're speaking to me today. I can read about all these people of Hebrews 11 and Think, wow, if some of those people can make it, I can make it too. 
And so God is with us and he's the strength of our life. So the idea is that we live by faith and just check out, even in your New Testament here, and we see 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 7. Let's read it all together, okay? Nice and loud. Here we go. For we walk by faith, not by sight. You know, that's easy to memorize, isn't it? Come on. We don't walk by faith, not by sight. You know what's really hard? Doing it. <laughs> you know, when, when everything in your life, your world is crashing down on you, it's like, hey, that's not in the plan. But it's happening. Because you're going to see before we leave today that there's such a battle beyond how you can even imagine that's going on in a spiritual world. And we'll talk about that. I want you to know that no matter how dark life becomes, when everything is so dim and you feel like you're all alone in a dark place, Jesus Christ is standing in the shadows. He's there. He does not leave you, nor does he forsake you. When it's dark, dark for you, and you don't know, where's my flashlight? You know what? Jesus is standing in the shadows. You're not alone. And God never intends for you to ever think that you're all by yourself. Jesus came to be with, not to be a part, to be with. He chose the apostles to be with him, not to be a part from him. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So remember, God did not save you just to start your race on earth. And you know, that's the race. It's not like on a track. It's talking about your life in Christ. You're born again. You get a brand new start in life, right? And now you're living in such a way that you're running a race. You're using the time, this gift of God called time, to glorify God. And we're to fix our eyes on Jesus so that we don't waste the gift of time that God gave us. So check out Acts 20, 24. And I really wanted to get this just in the King James only so that we could see this. We got Acts 20, 24. Okay, so but none of these things, Paul said, move me. He's not moved off course. Nothing would happen that would throw him off the course where he'd say, you know what, I'm done following Jesus. That was not the example we got from Paul. But none of these things move me, he says. Neither count my life dear to myself so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received from the Lord Jesus Christ. You got a ministry, Jesus Christ gave it to you. You don't invent your own ministry which I have received from the Lord, he says, to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And that was the ministry of Paul. And he stayed faithful until they chopped his head off. And then he had trouble talking. So anyway, his ministry was over. So, you know, and there are always some people out there that might say, oh, well, what about Philippians 1, 6, right? And you know that one, don't you? You can finish it if I start it, right? He who began is faithful to, to complete it. That's right. Um, it took a little while for some of you to remember that. It was great mumbling, though. You got it out, so <laughs> congratulations. Is really, Yeah, and hopefully everybody out there in YouTube land said it with us. So, yeah, the thing is, though, that even though Christ will complete the work that he began in you, there's nothing I can do to recover rewards that are lost. Remember, you have time. It's a gift. Paul says you're running a race. Finish your course. Will he complete the work that he desires to work in you to make you who he wants you to be? Sure. But at that point, that has nothing to do with rewards for your faithfulness. That's why God wants you to be enduring to stay in the race. Don't be distracted by different things that will hinder your race. All right, well, we're going to move on to casting every weight aside. In verse 1, therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, you've got all these examples with those examples, then, let us be inspired. Let us also lay aside every encumbrance or every weight, the sin that so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. This is God's word to us on this very Sunday morning, and I believe for such a time as this. Weights are things that hinder your progress, right? You can't win a race if you're going to run with a piano on your back. 
And, and, and I want you to know that when it talks about these encumbrances, these weights, it's not always sin. Some of them is, but some are not. And whatever wears us out, doing things God never directed us to be part of, those are the things that will hinder us. And God doesn't want those to be in our life. They eat up time, which is so valuable to all of us. What would be some of those things? Well, come on, you know what they are. Things that can eat up time that you, you don't feel like it's a big weight, but if you look at the outcome, your time has been wasted and eaten up. And come on, you can't sit here and tell me that when you're really obsessed with things like Twitter, Facebook, social media, taking, talking, well, what? How about talking on the phone when you're driving or anything else? Walking, people just walk and they're, you know, talking on their phone too. Television, watching TV, it can all be addicting. Every one of those things can be addicting. Why? Because there's a war going on and the devil is a master distractor. Can you say that with me? He's a master distractor. I just want that to be embedded in your mind. Satan is a master distractor, and he'll bring plenty of distraction. He's got a bag of tricks. He's got more bag of tricks than Dennis Eck next Sunday. So <laughs> you'll see. You don't want to miss next Sunday. So take a look at Luke in chapter 10, uh, verse 38. I should turn there and just look it over here. In Luke, give you a second maybe if you want to even follow, Luke 10, 38. And in this chapter, 1038, the Bible says, Now as they were traveling along, he entered, that is Jesus, entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. And so, you know, this is the family of Lazarus, who Jesus resurrected, Mary and Martha. She had a sister called Mary, who was seated at the Lord's feet, listening to his word. But Martha was distracted. Uh Uh-oh. There's that distracted word. With all of her preparations, and she came up, you know, she's just busy cooking or baking and, you know, sticking stuff in the dishwasher. And why is this thing in the refrigerator? I don't know. But she's distracted with all of her preparations, and she came up to Jesus and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? And then tell her to help me. And the Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha. You are worried and bothered about so many things. They were distractions, right? That's what he said. And but only one thing is necessary for Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. And that was to sit at his feet and pour out her love. And that to Jesus Christ was the good part. There's also, uh, there's plenty of things that people come up with. There are, Maybe people are looking forward to retirement. They're going to buy a house on a golf course in Florida. I don't know, you know, and it can consume your mind so much. There's careers. There's, um, I remember hearing the testimony of a man who's a good friend of mine saying, yeah, yeah, I was going to be a millionaire by the time I was 40. Well, it didn't happen, but, you know, but that consumed his mind and who he was. I'm going to be a millionaire by the time I'm 40 years old. Some people go for fame. Even there's a man in the Bible that said, wow, I'm doing so good. The economy is so great. I'll just build bigger barns and I'll store more food. But, uh, you know, Jesus had a different response for that man. In Luke, we see here in Luke 12, 20, God said to this man that he was a fool. He's just storing up all this that's going to be wealth to him. And I'll build bigger barns. And so, you know, I'll have a whole neighborhood of barns. And he says, you fool, this very night your soul is required of you. And now who will own what you have prepared? And so it is. The man who stores up treasure for himself is not rich toward God. So that self can be such a problem. And then even I can be my own distraction. If I want popularity, if I've got to have fame or just more money or something, I don't know what it is. But a lot of these things kind of creep in alongside of us and they they become those hindrances to running the race that God has for us. Now, how can I identify real, honest-to-goodness distractions? All you have to do 
is get alone with yourself and self-examine. What am I obsessed with? And just fill in the blank. What are you obsessed with outside of Jesus Christ? And that'll be the distraction that keeps you hindered and weighed, weighed down uh, that, with things that are keeping you off the course. Now, I had mentioned that not all these things are sin. I mean, it's not sin to talk on your phone. It's not sin to be on Facebook or look at Twitter. But there are sins then that become those kinds of weights that entangle us. And some are big and some are small. You know as well as I do that there are people that are Christians that simply let some sins hang around. It's like they consider or they've evaluated and they've talked themselves into thinking, it's not a big deal. And besides, nobody knows I'm doing this or thinking this. And, and so they think, well, it's not hurting anything. It is. It's a weight that they don't even know about. It's entangling. And some of those sins are just standing around like greed, gossip, lying, prejudice. All those kinds of things are, are not of God. The people can use logic sometimes. Catch this. Logic sometimes to make things that are sins bearable. Like you can just put up with it. You can just drag this thing along as though it's really not robbing you of anything. And thinking that a sin can be bearable and I'll just go through the rest of my life is only going to hurt that person. And so even some people will say, well, I'll deal with it at another time. I'll, you know, I got time. Nobody knows they have time. And so it's always good to amputate the sins. Just cut that out. And uh, sin entangles. That means to encircle. You know, I forgot the movie, the John Wayne movie I was watching. I don't know. He's the Confederate guys and the Union guys from the Civil War. And so they end up together and they're in Mexico. And then all the bad guys come out of the mountain. And so they round, you know, the circle of the wagons. But then the bad guys are all going around the wagon train and um, they're attacking. Well, that's what sin does. It encircles you so that you just can't walk out uh, without getting hurt, run over by somebody's horse or shot and killed. But sin will do damage to you, and we never want to make sin appear bearable. You never want to just talk yourself into thinking, ah, it's okay, God doesn't really care. He cares because he loves you. Sin entangles. And you know, is it not true that Pretty much everybody has at least that one thing. <laughs> you know, you might call it a weakness, a temptation, or there's that one thing. And Paul said that there is no good thing that dwells in me. That is my flesh. That's the principle of sin. It's not your skin on your body. It's the principle of sin that is inside each one of us. The heart of man is deceitful. It's desperately sick. Who can know it? So it means I can't even know the evil of my own heart. I can't measure it. Because I would say, well, I would never do that. And God would say, oh, in the right circumstances, you would. (laughs) So God knows you, God loves you, but he would not, get this, he would not tell you you can turn away from sins if it weren't possible. So nobody can say, I can't. I just can't. Because God gave us a Holy Spirit that empowers us, and that really is an edge that everybody needs. Listen, I brought this paraphernalia from my house. The Bible teaches us that when we take something off, like if we want to get, well, just in terms of a behavior, we take behavior, and we want to get rid of this thing. It's it's worthless, it does no good, and it, it looks horrible on us. So we want to get rid of it. So I, the best I could find was this old, paint sweatshirt that I wear in the wintertime. I really don't have terrible looking sweatshirts anymore because I can't put it on because of this wire. There you go. But, you know, this is the worst I got. It was used to be, I used to walk around like Bobo the Hobo because, you know, you get paint on your hands and I work with all kinds of colors. And so I was always doing this with my hands when the paint would get on my hand. So I just looked like, geez, you know, some guy that lives somewhere, not in the house, uh, homeless. And so, but if this dirty old thing full of paint and everything represented sin, something that God wants me to get rid of, 
Sometimes people will make New Year's resolutions and they'll say, well, I'm going to quit doing this. Come on, you've all made these. How many of you ever made a New Year's resolution? Just be honest and play the game with me. Okay, some of you are so smart you didn't do it. But, <laughs> but then, you know, for the most part, these resolutions fall to the wayside. And here's the idea. You're to take something off what God is showing us. is take something off and you're to replace it. You don't just stop doing something. The idea is then, oh, I hope we can do this. Get it through the wire. Ah. Okay, it basically worked. And you're supposed to put on something else, though. And so, in terms of being a Christian person, God empowered you to quit. Whatever the sin thing is, that small thing, that bearable thing that you talked yourself into. But to put on Christ. To put on Christ. To be like a little Jesus walking around in Black Canyon City or wherever you go on the entire planet. Uh, take a look here at Romans 13, 12, if you would, please. Um, let's go ahead and read this one all together, okay? Here we go. The night is almost gone, and the day is near. Therefore, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. So you lay the old junky stuff that's going to hurt you off, and then you put on new life in Jesus Christ. And if you say, well, I just can't, I can't quit doing that. That's why God gave you the Holy Spirit to pray with faith. God, help me to take that junky paint sweatshirt off. And you know what I'm saying, to let that habit, whatever that is, off. That doesn't please God and hinders my race and put on what he has. There's another one here in Ephesians. And so let's go ahead also and read this nice and loud. Here we go and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. And so that's the idea. The old, the hurtful, the hindering goes off, and God wants you to put on his righteousness. You know, if we're if we're righteous, and if you've come to Christ, you can't be in God's eyes any more righteous than you already are. The idea would be that we would live it, that you would actually live it out. That's what God has. This is more important now in these days than ever before. And if you've been here for any of our prophecy teachings, we went through like 10 weeks, 12 weeks of this stuff, you know how close we are to the rapture. And so let's move on to clearly being focused on Jesus. The third section on your note sheet is clearly focused on Jesus. So if we go back and we read Hebrews chapter 12, and here we go in verse 2, where the word of God did say, fixing our eyes now on Jesus. That's like giving full attention, being inclusive with Jesus, letting Christ be part of everything that you're doing in your life. I mean, if you're going somewhere and doing something you can't take Jesus, then probably you shouldn't be going there and doing that. Fixing your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy, the joy set before him endured the cross. You could read that real fast and say, well, that's kind of crazy. But the joy was you. He went to the cross to get you. You cannot say you're not loved. Jesus Christ came to get you. His whole goal, he was born as an infant. The day he came out of Mary, he was in the shadow of a cross like that one. And that's what he was waiting. That was waiting for him. And that's where he ended up. But he did it for the joy that was set before him, the joy of having relationship, friendship with you. He endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And it says, for consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against him, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. God did all that. He went through all the suffering for you. Fixing means to look away from all else and put your focus on your only hope of glory. Right? Colossians Chapter 1, verse 27. Your hope of glory is Christ in you. Hey, Jesus Christ is living in I mean, come on. I mean, really, I think a lot of people that say they're Christians need to ponder that. They need to do an evaluation. It's like, 
Call time off, you know, go to the sidelines and look at the playbook again. Because if you say you're a Christian, then Christ is living in you. And that is your only hope of glory anything after you leave this world. Focusing away from all else and putting a focus on Jesus Christ, who for the joy of saving you went to that cross. Take a look at John 17, 24. I got about three verses here. These should really build you up and strengthen you. And so it says, Father, I desire, as Jesus was praying, Jesus was praying and praying for you. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, be with me. See, when you gave your life to Christ, he accepted you because he wants to hang with you. He wants to be the best friend you've ever had. He wants to go everywhere with you, do everything with you. Be with me where I am so that they may see my glory, which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. The whole idea, God, let them be with me. And that's God's love for you. Even in the previous verse, which I wear out quite a bit, verse 23, Jesus is praying and he says, you love them like you love me. God loves you like he loves Jesus. (laughs) Okay, can you put on the next one here? And we go to Jude 24. Now to him who's able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless, with great joy. But for the joy set before him, Christ went to the cross. What? The joy is having you. Okay, and then we have one more here. In Zephaniah chapter 317 Um, If you've really doubted God's love for you, this will really, well, in that case, it'll be hard for you to absorb this. The Lord your God is in your midst, a victorious warrior, and he will exult over you with joy. And he will be quiet in his love, but he will rejoice over you with shouts of joy. It's like Christ is singing over you. He's happy to have you. He's He's more happy that you got saved than you are. But that's God's heart for you. You know, I was thinking about what it would be the best example, a good example anyway, to show you like, what what did he have to get us out of? Remember back in the late 1980s, they, they stopped because some child psychologist said, oh, you're hurting the feelings of so many children. But how many of you remember when they used to put missing kids on milk cartons? Remember that? Yeah, it was... Benjamin Spock said, ah, you're just scarring all the living children by letting them look at milk cartons. And so they stopped doing it, but it wasn't just milk cartons. They were putting kids' faces that were missing on pizza boxes. And then, of course, you still see them on billboards. You know what? We were like, our faces were on milk cartons in enemy territory, and Jesus Christ came here and got you. It's like you were on milk carton. I'll find that missing person. And Jesus Christ came to the cross. He did everything. He paid the price. And he found you. And he went to enemy territory. And he rescued you. And you belong to him now. That's great news. It's not just good news. You know, you've heard of Elijah and Elisha. And so Elijah being the mentor for Elisha. And so they were walking along And Elijah knew that his time had come and he was going to be taken by the Lord. And so he asked Elisha, well, what would you like? And Elisha said, well, I want a double portion of the Holy Spirit that you have. (laughs) He says, whoa, you're asking for a lot there, sonny boy. And so he says, I'll tell you what, if your eyes are open and you see me when I depart, you'll have it. And so what happens? We see there as we read that story that the chariots of fire came down from the sky and snatched Elijah. And Elisha was just, he, you know, screamed. My father, my father, you know, the chariots of heaven, he yelled out. And, and then he saw Elijah taken to heaven. And the requirement was, if thou see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be unto thee. And as he left, the mantle fell, and Elisha picked it up. And then you know the story, some of you do. He walked over to the edge of the Jordan River as he was going to cross, and he slammed that coat 
down onto the water, and the water split, and he walked across. So, I mean, the double portion of the Holy Spirit. What was the requirement? If you see, you know, I get a picture of Elisha sleeping with one eye open. I don't want to miss anything. <laughs> He's like that old Western actor. Remember Jack Elam? Is that a cowboy type guy? Yeah, he's like walking around like that. It's you know, like, you know, that giving everybody the evil eye, even if he wasn't evil. So, but, you know, I just think of you'd sleep with one eye open because you don't want to miss anything. But that was the intensity of, I got to see this. I can't miss this. And then he got what he wanted. He was rewarded because he kept his focus on Elisha, Elijah. And uh, who were their mothers that named them almost the same? But anyway. Moving along from there, and I hope you get it, that the focus is Jesus. If you can't take Jesus where you're going or what you're doing, then you don't need to go there yourself. Keep your eyes on him. And finally, I wanted to bring us into the spiritual realm because the word hostility was used in verse 3. And I want to read that again. It's very important because there is a spiritual world going on and, and there are spiritual things happening even right now. Even now in the room. Now. And, you know, there are, and people miss it. They totally miss it. Let's pray. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus right now, I pray, Father God, that there would be such a clarity of mind for people that they will be able to really take in, especially this section. Because a lot of these things can be historically found in the Bible. We can clarify and we can give definition. But Lord, the application for people here and people out there watching on YouTube is so important as lives can be changed to be more like Christ. We ask for your assistance in this in Jesus' name. Amen? I want to read verse 3 one more time. Considering the invisible hostility over the visible hostility. All right? Let's do that. For consider him, speaking of Jesus, who has endured such hostility by sinners against him. And let me tell you what, there are things that are happening in the spirit world that influence the sinners that were hostile towards Jesus Christ. So you not only have people that hated Jesus, you know, on that day, that night when they were interrogating him, beating him, whipping him, nailing him to a cross. Jesus said, and it's recorded in Psalm 22, where you really get an emotional picture of what was going on inside our Savior. It says that he was surrounded by the bulls of Bashan. You think, well, what is that? Well, on the east bank of the Jordan River, the clouds were squeezed by the mountains of Moab and in that area of Jordan. And it rained more and the grass was taller. And that's why some of the children of Israel who were ranchers, all the Jewish cowboys, wanted to stay on the East Bank because of all their cattle and the big grassland that was over there. And they asked Moses, so Reuben, Gad, Manasseh, they wanted to stay on the East Bank of the river and not cross over. Of course, it led to their demise when the attacks were on and the enemy came. They were the first that got attacked because they were on the fringe. They were not deep into what God had for them. So when we consider this invisible hostility, understand that the people of the land where Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh, the tribes of those, went and took their cows and their families, the people who they had to drive out were pagan idolaters who worshipped cows. The bulls of Bashan have surrounded me. So what? There was heifers all around and bulls? No. Paul said that behind every idol are demons. Behind idols, statues, things people bow down to are demons that cause that influence. And so when the Bible tells us the bulls of Bashan have surrounded me, it's those demonic spirits that they're antagonizing, they're laughing, they're mocking. And they were surrounding Jesus Christ. The hostility against our Savior was physical and it was spiritual. For consider him who has endured such hostility and by sinners against him so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. 
I want to just talk about the spiritual world there. Consider means to estim- estimate or contemplate the spiritual side of our whole existence. Because obviously you can see the physical, right? But then there's another dimension out there that is spiritual, and there are influences that are happening. And things are happening to steer you away from Christ. Those are the hindrances. Those are the distractions. The world is... You have these enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil. And all three are pulling at you. Come on, we've studied the end times, the rapture, the millennial reign. Satan is bound for a thousand years. And then when he's loosed, he actually tempts people to turn against Jesus and follow him. During that thousand years, they're not even going to have Satan, but people will still, in some cases, rebel. They'll still commit sins. Consider, to estimate, things that we can't see, but we know are happening. Now, many believers have not contemplated that this world is more spiritual than it is physical. And the spiritual world is vast. It's not limited to planet Earth. Here's what the Bible talks about in 2 Corinthians. Paul said that there were three heavens. He was talking about atmosphere. The first would be the atmosphere we're used to seeing, the sky. The second would be that realm of the spirit. You have God's holy angels. You have demonic forces, demonic spirits. And then you have what he called, it's not like there's three heavens all over. There's Third heaven was where the throne was, the throne room. But the battles that happen are in that second, that place that is in the atmosphere that's above. It's huge. And there are all sorts of conflicts between angels that happen in that area. And things that are visible are products of the things that are invisible. Just think about that. God spoke and the earth was created. The world, all the planets, everything, they came from nothing except his word. God spoke, and there it was. People like to say, well, there's a big bang theory. Okay, it's a theory. Number two about that is that God said it, and bang, there it was. It came from nothing, but God spoke. Take a look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 18. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary. This is all temporary. Everything, your wardrobe, your beauty, your whatever you have, it's all temporary. And for these things which, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Those, so there are wars going on in a spiritual dimension for eternal things like your soul. The spiritual realm is a place of conflict and this is where angels clash. And I am coming to the place where your prayers involve you getting in the fray. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. If you could put that up there. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. So, okay, there's a struggle going on. You're in a battle. You enlisted when you got saved. You say, well, I didn't sign up for this. Yes, you did. The struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places that I just talked about. There's battles going on. And you, when you pray, it's like you're launching bombs against the enemy. It's just the way it works and the way God set up the spiritual world. But spirits are controlling the world and spirits are controlling aspects of your life. And God wants you to have victory over those things. But there's many battles you cannot see. But whatever happens out there affects what happens, as they say, down here. So I want you to know that there's a lot more going on than you can see. Much more is happening than what your eye can see. Consider the Syrian army that was sent to apprehend Elisha. So later on, after Elisha saw Elijah taken, 
here was Elisha, and he had a servant named Gehazi. And so the army of the, the Syrians came, and they came right up to the door. And so that was really a moment of freak out. You know, it was like, okay, what do we do now? Except Elisha was very calm. And, El, and when Gehazi was all nervous and terrified, he was even more terrified when Elisha prayed, and he said, Lord, open his eyes, see, that he could see the spiritual realm. Open his eyes so that he could see. And Gehazi looked at the hillside that was surrounding them, and it was surrounded by chariots of fire. The angels of God from that other dimension were surrounding. And so what did Elisha say? There are more of them that are with us than there are with this army. So what did you see in the, in the physical? You saw two people. You saw Elisha and you saw Gehazi. But you can't see the army that's with them. But the army that is with them is bigger than the, the Syrian army. And that's how you and I have to look at our days. We have to face our days. When we're tempted, there's more who's with you than is with them. And what brings on the battle? What gets you the victory? Prayer, the very thing that is on the bottom of the totem pole for most Christians in most churches across America. Satan hates prayer. He's afraid of you when you pray. If you want to scare the enemy that wants to kill you dead and send you to hell, then learn to be a prayer warrior. Well, just don't do that very well. Then you're not disciplined. I and mean, that's what it takes. Discipline is doing what you're supposed to do when you're supposed to do it. It's not rocket science. So we hurt ourselves by not being people that are willing to get on our knees, get on our face. You know, you get here early enough, usually around 9 o'clock, and this floor is covered with uh, people on their knees. Just come. You can get on your knees and lay on the floor, I don't care, but pray and call on God. And we will always call on God, we, you know, because this meeting is a spiritual thing. Understand again, you are never alone. If you're a child of God, the army of heaven is there for you. The army of God Almighty, the army, the host of the army is with you. And you can ask for that kind of assistance and they will be, they have your back. But you've got to be a person who prays. They're, not, they're there for you no matter what you face and you're never alone. But listen, Spirits are influencing everything. They influence nations. They influence your life. Listen, we don't have the time. And, you know, most of you know my testimony and everything. I should have been killed a long time ago. Come on, you know that. I mean, the big thing. You, I fell from the second story on the back of my neck when I was in the sixth grade. I, could, I still played baseball. I played, I played the giant rookie league, all that. I got, I got world medals from the 2007 American Taekwondo Association, world champions, not national. This is the guy who was supposed to have a broken neck and be dead. In 2015, I was allergic to protamine. They didn't know I was allergic to it. Um, they did the surgery on me. They stuck the protein in, which is supposed to coagulate your blood and keep you from bleeding internally to death. They couldn't put it in me. They put it in me twice. University of Michigan studies show they had four people allergic to protein, and when they inject them with that chemical, they died suddenly. Your blood suddenly turns to something like wet cotton. That's the doctor's quote, wet cotton, jello. Your heart can't pump wet cotton. 14-hour surgery. They called everybody in the grief room. They said, he's not going to live to see the sun. And around 7 o'clock the next morning, I think I woke up and then I passed out again. And about, it was a, I think it was a day and a half later. Nobody knows, really. Everybody's lost track. I remember seeing Charlie Butler's face looking at me. It wasn't a dream. He really broke through all the lines and got through in uh, ICU. <laughs> Says Charlie, yeah. but yeah, the, and then it took about two days to really start figuring everything out. But I weighed 325 pounds in one day, bleeding to death. So anyway, I'm. I didn't mean to just repeat that all, but I'm just telling you, yeah. Satan's been trying to kill me for a long time. He'd like to take you out, you know, and. It, 
to me, it's worth the battle. I'd rather be in the battle than be a dead fish floating downstream. Anybody can be a dead fish floating downstream. Who, you know, that's a wasted life. I don't want to be that. So we see here about the influence of even nations. Daniel chapter 10, verse 13. There's a battle going on in the spiritual world. And so the prince of the kingdom of Persia was withstanding me. An angel was coming to answer the prayer of Daniel. And he prayed and he prayed and he was persistent in his prayer. Too many Christians give up. Just keep knock and keep knocking. Don't give up praying. Some people say, well, you asked once. If you had enough faith, it would just happen. Don't listen to those people. They don't know what they're talking about. But the prince, they are. They're just out there. The, the prince of the kingdom of Persia was withstanding me for 21 days. There was a fight going on for 21 days in the spiritual world. It's real. And then behold, Michael. That's Michael the archangel. The chief prince that came to help me for I had left there with the kings of Persia. He had been left with the kings. Kings, there was only one king of Persia. Who are the plural kings? Demons. There was only one king of Persia. His spiritual forces. He called kings. And he, the, this angel that was coming to be part of the answer to the prayers needed assistance. Listen, you're either controlled by the Holy Spirit or another spirit is going to control you. That's why the Bible says, walk by the Spirit. That your manner of living should be to follow the Holy Spirit. And if you're not doing that, you'll be controlled by another spirit and that won't be a good one. So understand the power of prayer and that it should never be neglected and I'm glad because, you know, Pastor is there reminding all the time. He says, we got to pray, we got to pray, we got to pray, we got to pray. And she's right. The prayers are affecting things in the unseen world and battles that are raging. See, and your prayers shift things around. If you want to do something strong and powerful, I mean, forget P90X or whatever they're advertising out there. Understand that your prayers are powerful and they shift things in the heavenly realm. And so we must persevere in our prayers in these days. That's the only way our country is going to pull out of this. It could, with the help of God, but people have proven they can't figure it out. We don't need more money. We don't need another program. <laughs> Plain and simple. The United States needs Jesus Christ. He's your one and only solution. So realize it or not, Prayer changes things. And it's not just you. It changes things literally. Colossians 2.10 tells us, let's read it all together, okay? Here we go. And in him you have been made complete. And he's the head over all rule and authority. So he's just waiting for you. I don't know why God wants you and I to partner with him in prayer. Ask him when you get there. If you need to know why, ask them when you get there. But God wants people to partner in prayer with him against all these battles and these demonic forces. We have an edge when we pray. So our authority in the spirit world is exercised through prayer and fasting. Listen, Satan wants to push you around, okay? Hear this, don't be a pushover. Don't let him come along. You know, there was a stance we used to, they had in the front stance, you know, they, they used to, when, you, when you're a rookie, you're a white belt, you know, they'll tell you to get your, with your feet pointed there and then one foot in front of the other one and then your instructor will come by and push you. He'll push your shoulder. Why? Because you didn't have your feet wide enough. The toes were right, but now you have stability. Don't let Satan push you over. Don't be a pushover. Be a person who has the edge in the things of like, pray for your children, pray for your grandchildren, pray for your whatever it is that you got going on. And pray for your church, pray for black king. souls to be saved. We're running out of time. So our authority in this world is exercised through prayer. And, uh, you know, don't let, stop, get mad enough so that you're tired of Satan dictating your life. Dictate your own life. Don't let him push you around. You know, Herod was a guy, in closing out, that had James 
killed and he arrested Peter. But the church gathered, remember that? And they were praying and uh, their prayers were answered. And remember the, the, the girl went over and answered the door because Peter was knocking at the door and she left him out there. <laughs> She's so freaked out. Our prayer got answered. And she left him outside and told everybody else, hey, Peter's outside. And they knew he was in jail, but he's standing outside. And they said, oh, you're drinking your bath water. You're smoking your socks. And he said, no, I'm not. There's no smoke in the air. Look, go see. And they let him in because they prayed the guy out of jail. They prayed him out of prison. <laughs> Sorry, I was, my mind was thinking of the day and age we live in. I think, well, maybe they should pray some of these people out. Well, they do. When they come to Christ, you know, they get them free. Prisoners in the system today can be free even though they're behind bars because who the sun sets free is free indeed. So for your homework, I'd like you to read Luke 18, 1 through 8. I think I put that on your note sheet. Uh, later today, um, take a look at that. Read Luke 18, 1 through 8. There's a great example there. And then, now, and I challenge you right now, how many distractions do you want to run your life? Decide. How many? <laughs> I don't want any. I don't want any distractions. I don't want to miss anything that God has for me. I mean, the reality of looking into the eyes of Jesus is so very, very real to me. I, I've messed up enough. I don't want to mess up anymore. Don't let anything, any demon rob you of your rewards. Um, when you pray, pray persistently. It's okay to repeat, all right? And your persistent prayer scares the enemy more than anything. And that's an enemy that wants to push you around. And so it was for the joy of getting you saved that Jesus saved your soul, but he also empowered you. And he saved you to let go of the weights so that you could run the race and do the best you can. You're not competing against other Christians. You don't have to save more people than Billy Graham or Greg Laurie or Luis Palau. Just, just be the best you can be for Jesus Christ. Let's go ahead and pray, okay? Father, thank you for these three verses in Hebrews as we go through the word of God. Thank you for the inspiration to fix our eyes on Jesus, to run the race with endurance, to let go of all the weights, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who expressed love for us so powerfully. Father, I want to pray right now. I don't know even everybody in the room, and I don't know who's watching on YouTube right now. I pray, Father God, that you will draw them close to Jesus Christ, that these minutes as we close would not be wasted, but that you could do even your greatest miracle in these closing seconds. And I would pray, Father God, that there would be such a change in people who don't know Jesus, that you would do a work in their life right now. And I ask it in Jesus' name. You can all look up. You know, I decided that when I get in conversations, I'm going to quit asking people if they're a Christian. Because, you know, they, either they hate Christians or they'll just say, oh, yeah, I am. And, you know, that doesn't mean anything. How do you know that? You know, they oh, yeah, I'm a Christian. Everybody that wants to say that can say it. And I think that for me, and if you want to borrow this, you can, but I think that if I get in discussions with people, I'm going to ask them, do you know Jesus? And I don't care what they say, but then they, does he know you? <laughs> what does he know about you? What do you know about him? Because when you get into the no factor, then, you know, so I would ask us here and I would ask you over there, do you know him? Do you, do you know him as your savior? Do you know that if you died today that you would be ushered into his presence and he would say, well done, you good and faithful servant. I'm really happy about you. What a great job of living your life that I gave you for me. Would he say that? Or would there be something else that realistically would happen to you? Because there's heaven and hell, and, and here's how it really is. Aside from what anybody wants to tell you on The View or CNN or <laughs> any, anywhere on television, just understand that this is the testimony that God has given us 
eternal life. And this eternal life is in his son, Jesus Christ. He who has the son has life. He who does not have the son does not have eternal life. These things are written to you who believe in the name of the son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. God doesn't want you to just wish wishful thinking, wonder. He wants you to know that you know you have eternal life, no matter what happens, no matter what's on the news, no matter what city is getting burned up, just to know that you know Jesus Christ and your future is bright. And so the Bible tells us that for as many as received Jesus, to them he gave the right to become the children of God. See, God wants to adopt you. You're not a child of God until he adopts you. You're a human, but you're not a child of God. Even those who believe in his name are the ones who get adopted. And this is what it means to believe in Jesus. To entrust your spiritual well-being to him. It doesn't mean you believe in the man upstairs or there's a God out there somewhere. It means that you have entrusted your spiritual well-being to Jesus Christ. So, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. That's a public thing. If you confess with your mouth, you believe Jesus is Lord, and you believe that God raised him from the dead, the promise of God is you'll be saved. It's a confession thing, for with the, with the mouth, uh, with the heart a man believes unto righteousness, but with the mouth they confess unto salvation. So, whosoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. I want to give you that opportunity right now. Can we bow our heads and our hearts one more time? And if you're a born-again Christian, will you pray? If you're somebody who you know that you're really not walking, you're not living in step with Jesus Christ, and you know uh, that there are hindrances in your life that you cannot or have not let go of, God will give you power. The first thing he'll do is save your soul, but you've got to invite him in. You have to accept the gift. The free gift of God is eternal life. You've got to accept the gift. So I'm going to lead you in a prayer that is really between you and God. If it's just a prayer, that won't mean anything. But if you mean the words to him, a personal relationship will develop in an instant. Why don't you just tell God right now, God, I am a sinful person. I agree with you. But I believe in Jesus Christ. And at this time, I entrust my spiritual well-being to you, Jesus, as my Lord. That you own me. Forgive me of my sins. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. And if you just give me the power, I'm willing to repent of sins and anything that does not please you. So fill me with your Holy Spirit. I give you complete control of my life. Don't ever leave me. I'm all yours. Thank you. Amen. You can all look up. I like to ask people to do something very simple. Uh, if you're at home or wherever watching, then you might tell somebody if you prayed like that. And if you're here today, would you do something very simple? Jesus hung on a cross in public and was abused. He's not ashamed to call you his. And don't be ashamed to call him yours. So if you prayed like that, and you know you connected with God, would you just raise your hand just long enough for me to see it? That's all. Just anybody in the room, you prayed, and you know that today is the day. All right. Praise the Lord. Well, let's stand, and if you prayed out there in YouTube land, um, you could email us at office at calvary.net, and uh, drop us a line and let us know. What is that, Karen? YouTube. Say it. Office. Office at calvarybcc.net. All right, there you go. So do that. 
Jesus never fails. Jesus never fails. Heaven and earth will pass away, but Jesus never fails.